<laughs> well, hello and welcome everyone to our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Um, real quick before we get started, if you're having any sound quality issues, um, which does tend to happen every now and then, just simply make sure to uh, head up to that uh, audio tab, click on computer audio, uh, click sound check. If that doesn't work, switch between computer and phone. If that doesn't work, log out and log back in and that should resolve 99% of all your issues. Um, for those of you who need your CUs, make sure you just take the CU quiz that pops up um, at the end or the same one will be sent to you an hour later. Just take it once. Even if you don't need CEUs, we definitely love all of your feedback. So make sure to take it and let us know how we did. Uh, we have a ton of stuff coming up this summer. We're so excited. We're scheduling a lot more. Um, next week, we're going to be kicking off our LEAD Green Associates exam prep virtual training on Monday. So get signed up for that. And then we'll have Uncontrolled Moisture, the Enemy of a Healthy Home webinar uh, coming up on Wednesday, continuing our series. And then we'll we'll be diving back into our Green Raider virtual credentialing cohort on July 6th. If you missed that one, you can jump into that now and get signed up uh, ahead of time for July. Check them out at our events page. Our member spotlight, real excited to have Tom Bassadilly Architects on our member spotlight this week, focusing on homes and how we've been able to get a better sense of how we're living in our homes and how we can make them better uh, to respond to um, pandemics and outbreaks and second waves as they occur. So you can check it out over at tbaarchitects.com on their blog, and you can become a member and get in our member spotlight next time at greenhomeinstitute.org slash become a member. Well, welcome everybody to In the Field or Office, a safety certification for COVID-19, a free CE webinar. Um, just real quick, this course is approved for GBCI, AIBD, Neri Green, BPI Non Whole House, as well as uh, pending for AIA Health, Welfare, and Safety, which may make it applicable to your state based design or contractor license. Uh, today, I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little. I'm the executive director here at the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. And, you know, really what your key takeaway is to head down that pathway to get started feeling safe in the field or at work. That's really what, what, why we're here today. And that's what we're excited to be talking about. And before we get started, a huge thanks to our top tier sponsor, Ream, and talking about their hybrid all electric um, heat pump system, um, 50, 65, 80 gallon. I heard there's gonna be larger ones. Up to 370% efficiency. Um, Ream stands behind their product, the 10 year warranty. Quieter than the typical loud heat pump. I have one, I barely hear it. Uh, and there are tons of rebates um, for this product as well. Um, different strategies, venting, going ducted uh, or not ducted, just depends on what your setup is, what kind of climate you're in. Talk with your HVAC on, on how you wanna handle that when you do install it. And it's smart, it's gonna tell you if there's a leak, when to change filters, I believe, any other issues you need. Gives you your energy use data all to your phone. And uh, utilities are using these as battery systems now to store energy, uh, you know, when grid demand is high and then release it later. So you can potentially, depending on what utility you're on, enter into that agreement. Check it out at ream.com hybrid savings. Also, thanks to our second tier sponsor, Niagara Conservation. They've got some of the lowest flowing toilets on the earth. Uh, huge recommendations from our affordable housing nonprofit renovation specialist to install and save energy uh, or save water and money with these vacuum assisted uh, toilets with ADA approval on them as well, if necessary. 0.8 gallons per flush um, for this kind of technology, as well as super low flow uh, water uh, shower heads and aerators as well that definitely work, don't feel low flow. Check them out over at uh, Niagara Conservation. All right, so I'm very excited to be welcoming our speaker, um, Amanda Hathaway. She is the Director of Energy Smart Academy ESA at the Santa Fe Community College. The ESA trains working professionals in the residential and commercial energy and water efficiency fields, including Building Performance Institute and Building Operator Certifications. She is a board member of both Energy Out West and the Building Performance Institute. So with that, Amanda, we're so excited to have you here and I'm gonna turn control over to you and have you please uh, take it away. Okay. 
share my screen. So can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, my name's Amanda, and we are based in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, we're a training center. We do a lot of work with uh, the Weatherization Assistance Program, with um, people in the home performance community, and with people who work with large commercial buildings. Um, let me get my controls here. Okay, so here's a picture of a beautiful building that we and none of us have been in for three months and the lab on the right hand side where we do a lot of the hands on training. Um, and here we are in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So when we started our training program, it was in the weatherization, it was in the hour period when there was a lot of money floating around for people to do home performance energy efficiency training and uh, we had a lot of people that would come and take training with us, but as money got a little tighter um we because we're in such a sort of a tiny little location uh far away from a lot of the big population centers we started developing a lot of online courses um, and we've been very successful with our online courses so i've just got a whole bunch of them here that you can see we've got some of the building performance institute classes we've got um smart thermostats healthy home evaluator um, and these are all online so people could take a bulk of training without actually having to come and fly all the way or drive all the way to Santa Fe, um, or they could do the bulk of the training online and then maybe just come and do a short amount of field training. So that was how we approached it for years and we really developed out good online classes. So when COVID-19 hit and everyone had to work from home and take classes from home, we were really well positioned to help um, you know, people with their training needs. And one of those training needs was how to get back into homes with this pandemic going on. So we decided that we would develop a class. Here's the class, COVID-19 Workplace Safety. Um, and it was going to be an online class. We were asked to do this at the state level for New Mexico. And we developed it and um, we used um, uh, all the relevant C uh, occupational safety and health administration information um we used uh, all the relevant information from the cdc and then we have an amazing safety uh, instructor her name's janet curley and she's nationally recognized has over 25 years worth of experience um she's served as liaisons on all types of national boards ANSI. um she works with fema and so she became the main um subject matter expert for us to develop this course we also have you know, a lot of experienced home professional uh, instructors that work with us um, in building energy efficiency. So we utilized you know, a bunch of people to develop this course um, really quickly, because I don't know if you know, but online courses is about 60 hours of um, course development for every one hour of good online content uh, for an online course. So it took us about a month with four people working nonstop and we developed this course. And I'm going to walk you through uh, some of how the course works. So these were the course learning objectives. And, and at the end, I know we'll have time for question and answer. So you can ask all kinds of questions. Uh, I'm hoping that some of your questions might get answered as we go through. Um, so I think this was on the information that Brett might have sent out. And we came up with these course objectives and the course uh, covers all this material. So what I'm going to do is go through the different how the course looks online. Um, We've got an overview and I'll go through each of these modules and, and explain to you what the, what's in the course. Uh, we have each of these opens up into a bunch of little screens. So for example, here's module one. Going back, you'll see module one, it says about COVID-19. When you click on module one, it opens up and we have an overview, things to do, what we know currently. Uh, every, every video that we have has a quick quiz. Uh, and then we have some interactive features and then at the end of each mod module we have a final quiz that's actually graded so as you go through you can take the quick quizzes multiple times uh, and the final quiz which is graded is made up of those quick quizzes so um, if you've gone through it the the final quizzes are really easy and so for example if you look at what we currently know um, these are short videos, and this video is almost four minutes long, and this would go over signs and symptoms of COVID-19. Um, every uh, module is made up of short videos and then a little quiz. And so here, for example, a 
two of the questions on one of the quizzes. So it's not really difficult, but they're more to reinforce the information that you learned in the video. Here's a couple more, like the 19th in COVID-19 means it's the 19th coronavirus or it was identified in 2019. So if you've watched the video, these quizzes are very straightforward. Um, so module two is the one which really gets more in depth on all the safety precautions that you need to know if you're going to be going into homes where people are or if you're working even in an office, uh, because a lot of this relates to office staff as well. And you can see we have uh, a transcript for each module, so you can download the transcript and everything that we talk you've talked about is in that transcript. Um, we have a quick quiz. We talk about hierarchy of controls, which is a, if you've taken OSHA training, you, I'm sure you understand. Um, here's an example of one of the transcripts, just basically talks, has everything written out. Um, Here's further on that module, we talk about chains of infection, how you can break a chain of infection, who's responsible in your office, and different levels of risk, people working in your company who may be at risk most. Um, obviously, wash your hands is a key, key component. Um, we include not just uh, content that we've created, but for example, this is a really good content from the internet that Vox did about soap killing coronavirus. So we have that type of content also. Um, we talk about PPE, gloves, donning and doffing gloves, uh, some of the information about eye and face protection, cleaning face shields, uh, which type of mask is appropriate for what type of worker. And as you can see, there's little quick quizzes. Um, more about mask selection, cleaning and disinfecting and the difference between the two, how you don't mix cleaning products, which is very important. We have very, just like for all, we have Can everyone still hear her? I, I cannot. Amanda? Amanda, we, um, unfortunately, we, we, we cannot hear you right now. I don't know if you can hear us. Just disconnected for a minute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Right? Yeah, okay. So was I on this page about um, disinfectant resources? You just started talking about disinfection and then you cut out. Okay, okay. So um, we talk about disinfection and cleaning and the difference between them. And then we have um, a page of resources. For example, you can click on these links. You can find out the difference between um, approved, you know, the different approved disinfectants for SARS-CoV-2. And for those of you who may be a bit confused, the actual virus is called SARS-CoV-2, and the disease is called COVID-19. So the disease it's called COVID-19, but the virus's name is SARS-CoV-2. Um, we've got information that links from CDC about disinfecting facilities um, and guide to environmentally friendly cleaning products that many of them are on the uh, EPA list of approved disinfectants. So we have different resources like that that are embedded within the course. Um, we talk about cleaning in the field, staying safe at your home, how to you know, not, when you've been at work, get home safely and keep your family safe. And then, as you can see, module two, we have a final quiz again, which is graded, and that is made up of all of the uh, little quick quizzes that were throughout the course, that module. So then the next module we get to is called the breakout module. And this one, you don't have to take the module. You can choose what you want to take, depending on your work. So you can see that we have a module 2B here, and that's office protocols. So this would all be for people who work in the office, but of course, if you're going in and out of an office, it's still a bit, you're generally like a contractor. This is still important information for you. And so you can see there's information about social distancing. And this, this gets more into the nitty gritty of how you do your work rather than information, for example, about disinfectants. Um, it talks about the social distancing, 
how to deal with bathrooms in an office, um, washing your hands again, <laughs> um, desk maintenance, cleaning protocols for your office and ventilation. Uh, and then it talks a bit about some of the technologies that get tossed around, like um, some of the UV light technologies and things that, that people hear about, but they don't know if it's appropriate or it's not, or it's just something that came up on the internet. Um, it talks about remote uh, client interactions and how to best go about trying to minimize when you actually might have to go out in face-to-face -face situations and the, how you can do things remotely. So that is the office protocol section. And then we have a section on assessments. So if you're going into the house doing an, some type of an assessment, um, and we've got remote assessments, uh, what you might do before you go with uh, pre pre client prep, um, client education, tools and equipment that you know how to deal with your tools and equipment that you're taking out um, with you, um, social distancing, risk containment, and then we have oh so the contractor and crew protocols. Some of this is going to be the same as the previous um, little modules. So you get social distancing, management of your tools, same thing where you've got client interactions. Um, and then we have, then at the end of that, there is no final quiz. There are little quizzes throughout, but because you may not necessarily be taking the entire module, we don't have a final quiz for that module. And, and then the last part, which we felt was really important, is on communication. So we have the transcript again, we have um, information about stress levels, self-care, listening effectively, um, because a lot of the problems that happen in the offices and on the work site come about because of um, incorrect listening skills and ineffective communication. So you can see we have um, clear messaging, appropriate language, um, you know, not using uh, terminology that other people don't understand. Um, and that module does have a final quiz. So then at the very end, we have a final quiz. So this final quiz is 50 points and it is made up, it's pulled from all of those quizzes you've done so far. So if you've been going through the course doing those quick quizzes, this is easy. And in fact, I think nearly everyone who's taken the class has got like 95% on the I'll go back. We have a page with helpful resources. And then the final page, um, is congratulations, you've completed the class and you will get a badge. So we're using a digital badging system from Acclaim and I've whited out some of the logo information here so that you don't see it. But um, the COVID-19 Workplace Safety Badge is online. We send you a, a link to get in to claim your badge and then you always have that badge. You, I don't know whether you that had digital badges before, but you can send a link to the badge to employers. You can add the badge to your um, LinkedIn or Facebook page so that other people just click on it and they can see what you've done. So in this case, you can see that um, what when you click on the badge, it has this information and then it also has information of all of the things you've gone through the earning criteria. So instead of just getting a that just says congratulations you've passed the class with this badge anyone can click on it and see all the information that you are supposed to have no, uh, understood <laughs> by the time you've got the badge so it's a lot more detailed than a typical certificate um, but you can also um, through this digital badging click on a link and actually have a downloadable pdf certificate that you can then also print out or use or, or send to people so we've started using digital badging because it, it seems to be a lot more flexible for people and it gives more information. So the class is also approved for two BPI CEUs, and this is just the information about that, the CEUs that we offer. And all of our online courses are at our online um, website, the Energy Smart Academy, and there's a list of all the courses, including this course. Um, this course, we charge $75 per person, uh, or if you have five or more people, it will be $50. But for this webinar, people who are watching it live or in the recorded version, 
if you were to email me and say, I watched the webinar, we are doing a, um, so $50 per person, whether there's just one of you or two of you, no matter what. Um, and you would just email me. We do either accept credit cards or we do a simple contract, which we invoice against. Um, there's my contact information. Um, what other information was I going to tell you before I open it up for questions? I think that's about it. So, Brett, do you have questions? Yeah, actually, Karen, uh, or uh, sorry, I think some of your slides have stopped. It looks like you're stuck on module three, but I, I do see several more Let's slides. See I can see questions. Can you hear me, Amanda? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it looks yeah, like I can hear several more mm -hmm. slides to go through. Um, just based on the slides you sent me, um, I see you're you're stuck on module three here, so I didn't know if you had more to go over. Oh, I've been going through them all, but no, I went through all the slides. Moved, Maybe they didn't. haven't moved since module three communications. Oh, okay. I'm going to go back. Can you see my module three communication? I. That's the only one I see. Yeah. Right. Do you see the, the one saying you're almost done? No, no. I just put it up. Huh. No, I, Do you want to show them from your side? I could. I mean, I don't if know you, why if you, they would be stuck because I can. Yeah, if you, if you went through everything. I'm looking at I, I, Yeah, I did. And I went through the slides as I talked. So I don't know why they, because I can yeah. see them on my screen. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, no, they definitely got stuck. But let me, um, here, I can. Uh, I can I can take control here, and if you yeah, want to, you need to reference any uh, okay. slides. I could talk we, those slides through again. Just overall, though, um, okay. we still got quite a bit of time left here, so we're not, you know, we still have hopefully another 25 minutes before we get to Q and A. Um, but if if we, if we want to make this more okay. discussion based, I think that's great too. Uh, I think I think people are going to have a lot of questions mm -hmm. and concerns. I see some coming in, so if we want to if we want to do it yeah. that way. Um, you know, that's great. So I think some of the questions that are coming in, um, and I don't want to, you know, put words in anyone's mouth here, but just in overall, like, um, you know, can you start really getting into some of the strategies and tips um, just that you can give to us now? And then obviously they can, hopefully they can go join your class and then reinforce them in the class. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to take back control of the screen and then show those last slides because there's some good pictures uh, and information yeah, on them? Uh, I don't I'm know sorry. why. I was, I was not prepared for you to be done this fast, so I I'm scrambling here a little bit. Um, oh, so just, okay. Just, well, just, is yeah, my screen changing um, at all? Because I, on my end, I see all the all the different slides, and yeah, I don't know why they aren't changing. I I think you just had a um, you just had a. Um, uh -oh. So yeah, if you could just help, you know, if we can keep things going, just start to give us some, some, um, you know, some tips and tricks here for what we need to be looking out for in the field and in the office. Okay, so I'm going to go back to some of the information. Um, I'm, I'm just going back through my slides to get some ideas. Okay, so obviously, and I'm sure everyone's heard this, washing your hands is the, one of the most effective things. You've got to wash it for 20 seconds to be able to kill the virus. The virus gets killed by the soap. Uh, it's very effectively killed by soap breaking down the barrier of the virus. So using soap is uh, washing your hands is obviously best and not touching your face, which I don't know if you guys have found is almost impossible not to do. And there I am touching my glasses. Um, <laughs> uh, and then when you're talking about the, the PPE that you need to use, um, per OSHA recommendations, um, if you would be using gloves in the field for your job, for example, you're underneath in a crawl space and you would be putting gloves on, then obviously, um, you know, you would be using the same protocols that you would use for your OSHA training. Uh, and we do go through gloves and donning and doffing gloves. Some of the, some of the things that people are talking about, like wearing um, white, um, what are they called? The not hazmat suits, the white um, full body Tyvek suits. Um, some of those, are, if you would wear one of those because it's part of your job, like you know, you're a painter, then obviously you would wear it. You don't need to wear it if you're 
going into houses with people. The, the issue with going into houses where there are people is that the people may not look sick, but because you can be um, pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, which I know is really confusing to people these days, and I'll address that in a minute, um, three to four days before you actually come down with symptoms, you can be shedding as much virus, as, like at the highest rate um, of any part of the illness, um, except for the first couple of days. So a couple of days after you actually come down with symptoms and a few days beforehand, you're shedding a lot of virus. So you don't know if you're um, going to be contagious, you don't know if your coworker is, and you don't know if the people you're working with in an office or the people in the in a home you might be going into, you, you don't know whether they are going to be shedding a lot of virus or not. So that's why we need to be taking these precautions. And that's why when you go into a grocery store, you have that you know, plastic shield between you and the person who's uh, checking you out because you don't, they don't know who of all the people going past them may be shedding virus. You know, none of you may have temperature, none of you may have a fever, but one person may be shedding and one person may not. Um, and that's one of the key concepts to get across. A couple of days ago, the World Health, or maybe yesterday, World Health Organization spokesperson came out with some very confusing language about asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people and whether they're contagious. Um, and they've corrected that because what they said was very confusing to people. Um, you know, there are some people who have very little symptoms the entire time they have COVID-19 and there are other people who can, you know, end up in hospital. And there are people pre-COVID-19, you know, before they show symptoms that are very contagious. And so the best uh, recommendation is to just assume that anyone that you come in contact with could be highly contagious. And that's one of the recommendations why there's so much a recommendation about wearing masks and social distancing. Yeah, um, you know, and um, it's interesting because I, I um, one of the one of the questions I had is, um, do you have a platform or uh, anything you're setting up um, for continuing education to maintain this designation? And because we obviously see that we're in early stages and there's going to be new information coming yeah. out about this for years. Obviously, some of that most recent new information, such as uh, what they said last, which on Monday, which was very concerning. And then, you know, who came out and said, hey, you don't have to wear masks unless you're sick. Of course, they weren't talking to the people in the U.S., right? They were talking to people outside of the U.S. Should have made that a little bit more known in the headlines. So just PSA here, you do. Don't listen to that one if you're, if you're listening to me in the U.S. But anyway. You know, new information is coming out, and some of it obviously better information that should be relevant. So, will there be any um, con ed keeping up with this? Like, what are the thoughts there? Um, our, what we're going to do is, if there's dramatically different information, we will add in an extra module, uh, or we will change out specific recommendations in the course, so that if you if you have access to the course. Today, in a year, you can still you still have access to the course. We don't lock you out, and we can add in extra recommendations and revise things as we go. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Um, so and I think there's a there's a huge amount of um, confusion around N95 masks, and that's something that is changing. And part of it is because of the difficulty in getting enough N95 masks for people. Um, some of the supply chains, and I know that um, OSHA has been. Um, uh, it's not they're not called it's not called relaxing their guidance. They've been allowing some. Um, what would you call it? I can't remember the, exactly what it is. It's um, they're allowing some flexibility with their guidance around N95 masks so that as an employer, if you cannot access N95 masks for your employees, if you have a written protocol in place for how you are dealing with employees who are let maybe in close contact face to face with the general public or people, other people apart from just their close social circle, you may do things like have maybe a face shield that you wash, or you may show that you are um, you're taking best practices by uh, you can have an N95 mask and wear it one day, put it in a paper bag for three to four days, and then wear it the fourth day. So you could maybe have five N95 masks, wear one Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The following week, go back to the Monday one, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you can do that up to three times. So that allows you to have more flexibility with 
N95 masks, for example, and that's that information's in the course. And you've just gone to where I can't hear you, Brett. <laughs> uh, now I can hear you. Now I can hear you. There you go. So yeah, I've actually I just learned two weeks ago about um, K and or K95, the Chinese version of the certification. Yeah. Any specific thoughts there? Education around that on the on the course seems like those are easier to get. Yeah, and those are those are all right. Those are okay to use um, so long as they are uh, with the approval. I think it's oh, I've just forgotten whether it's not FDA. Um, there's an approval that would come with it that's a U.S. approval because there are also companies from China that are selling sort of fake masks. I don't think they're the KN95s though. So I think the K ones are fine. Yeah. Um, so there's a question here, if you can give any more um, hints to uh, the proper sequence for donning and doffing, I believe that is adding and removing gloves. Um, so it's all in the actual course right. with videos. Right. And right, I'd right. rather you actually watched it than me try to like tell you over here and sure. getting incorrect. Because also you could just know. Google, you could just right. go into YouTube and just go donning and doffing gloves and there's a bunch of them in there. Right, yeah. right, it's in the training. So yeah, more specific. Yeah, uh, yeah some of the stuff just gets into real specific details. Yeah, uh, I would like, you know, I'm going to say, because I know that I don't know whether there's talk around amongst this group around like should you use blower doors for blower door testing and that type yeah. of thing no um, I'm glad you said that and I was going to bring that up and real quick before I did I did upload a handout um, that we received from uh, an I energy conservatory from, yeah from energy conservatory so you all have yeah. that handout uh, energy conservatory unfortunately will not do any specific education because they just want to defer to the states and the CDC but it's a fantastic handout so take a look at it. But yeah, man, I was going to ask you a little bit more if you could just speak to, you know, what we're starting to learn about board or testing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, one of the things with COVID-19 is you have to have, um, it, it, there's not much evidence yet that if you're just walking around outside and you come across some viruses that are sort of little tiny airborne particles that are in a huge space, that you're going to get enough of a virus a load to cause you to become sick with COVID-19. Most of the evidence is showing that it's in people that are in enclosed spaces, like offices, or you're in like that choir that was singing, or you're on a boat with people, you know, in a in a cruise ship in restaurants. And so, I, I, what I say to people is that there's when you think about risk assessment, there's all kinds of places where you're going to have far more risk than doing a blow or test with a house where there may be virus load in that house, but it's being blown through the house, uh, blown through the blow or and if you're standing right in front of the blow or breathing it in, um, that you're way more at risk going in an enclosed vehicle with a coworker for half an hour to get to a job site where you don't know if that coworker, for example, has, um, is pre you know pre symptom has asymptomatic has not showing symptoms yet but has got COVID nineteen that's much higher risk it's much higher risk going into an office where there may not be adequate ventilation and people may not you know be practicing good hygiene than doing a blood or test and I know the energy conservatory said for multifamily housing there's a higher risk because you could be bringing in virus load from other buildings into that space other units into that space but if you're in a house that may where there may be someone who is not showing signs of COVID-19 but is shedding virus if you have on a mask if you're taking good precautions if you're doing a blow or test um, the risk to you is I think lower than a lot of other times when you're out in public or in your office or driving with co-workers places people sort of get all hung yeah, up about the blower door <laughs> Right, right. And yeah, thank you. We, um, you know, we have some information here that we posted on there on the screen right now. And, um, you know, one of the other things, too, is we've just been telling folks, if you are doing them, especially in occupied space, that you can do it from the exterior, right? I mean, just yeah. walk outside and you can do your blower door outside. I mean, that's a pretty, yeah. pretty low hanging fruit there. Um, yeah. to, and, 
And also one of the important things right now we know is having adequate ventilation and being able to do a blow door test is what gives you information as to whether there's, you know, how the ventilation is in the house also, how much air leakage there is. When you look at those scenarios, you can look at scenario three and scenario four. It says occupied multifamily dwelling and then number four, buildings occupied by, occupied by people known to be infected or suspected of being infected. Well, at that stage really, I mean, I think you just have to assume that everybody could be infected or suspected of being infected because, as I said, you can be shedding virus and walking around looking entirely healthy. And so there's no way, I mean, I don't really see the difference between there's someone who's got COVID-19 and there's another house you're in where you don't know, but they, they could have COVID-19. So I think that's why those three and four, I think, are almost to me, this similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, um, question here, and uh, you know, you speak to it as much as you can, and I assume it's covered in the video. How do you measure six feet in an office environment? Some people at our office believe it's from the center of a desk to a center, as opposed to six feet from each desk. Do you have any materials or guidelines for those of us who believe it should be six feet from the desk? Very specific question. <laughs> I do. No, I, I don't, but I would say the more distance you could have, the better. There was a paper that came out where they aggregated a lot of different papers that came out from the, I think, National Institutes of Health two days ago, and they, they had a bunch of different research, and our recommendations of six feet um, seemed to be very conservative, and they were they had many different research studies that show it could be eight to 21 feet of spread and so i would say six feet if you can have more than that it's even better than that i mean i think if you are in an office six feet apart and there's not adequate ventilation and nobody people you know walking around the office the six feet really um <laughs> i don't know how much that's going to help you you know right um and kind of following up on that how should someone address co-workers who don't wear masks when sitting less than six feet apart or think wearing a mask in the field is optional because it's conflicting policy gets communicated. Then I think you're you have to have very clear policy at the from your employer down. And if you're an right. employee and your employer doesn't think it's very important, um, mm -hmm. I think you need to have a conversation with your employer. And I'll just say we did have a conversation with one state where they were trying to clarify this. Um, and one of the things that came up is that there's no insurance that you can get right now to cover yourself or people with COVID-19. There's just, there's no national no insurance you can buy. Um, if you were an employer and you had um, employee, you did not, you could, it could be shown that you did not put good protocols in place. There's definitely, I think, a case later on for an employee who gets sick and it can be traced back to the improper protocols uh, workforce comp claim. So mm -hmm. I would think that from an employer's standpoint, you'd want to put as many good protocols as you can in place. And then you'd also want to document why you may not be able to do some. And that's also one reason why they're recommending it as much as possible to have employees work from home in an office situation. So if you don't really need to be in an office working, working from home is way, way better. And staggering people coming in. I mean, there's if you've got five people in an office and your desks are six feet apart and you're requiring them to come in every day, I think that's just setting yourself up for for issues down the line. Um, let's hold on to that thought about um, insurance. Um, and then there's another question coming in here where I'd like you to elaborate on that question. Um, so I'm asking her to elaborate real quick. Yeah. Uh, but real quick before we get to all that, just reminder. For those of you looking for your continuing education units, um, if you're watching this live, take the survey that pops up in your email. The same thing will be uh, sent to you either email or when you pop when it pops up at the end. Um, for those of you watching this on demand in the future, not right now, take that 80%, uh, take that quiz with an 80% passing rate. You can score your CEUs that way. Those of you watching live, you do not need to take the quiz. Uh, where do you find that quiz? Head to the YouTube link well, anyway, at least one of the places. And then head down on the left there, click show more. And then on the right there, you'll see a link to grab that quiz, follow the instructions uh, to take it. And just again, huge thanks to our top tier sponsors, all of our members, our board of directors, uh, all of those who allow us to do what we do, Mitsubishi Electric to go to net zero all electric, single family, multifamily, new construction, 
uh, all over ventilation and all electric heat pumps air source systems that work when it's super cold. Ream air source ducted uh, and ductless uh, water heating for air source heat pumps. And build Equinox smart ventilation, something we need right now, detect pollution exhaust when it needs to occur. Um, so I wanted to get on, on insurance here while I'm waiting for the other attendee to follow up with her question um, that I'm trying to understand. And you had made a statement about not not insurance. Do you mean health insurance doesn't cover? Or can you help under, help me understand what you mean? No, no. I mean, I mean, you can't take out insurance to cover yourself, your, your employees, or if people get COVID nineteen. There's just not a. There's nothing out there that you can like take out an additional policy to cover COVID nineteen. Mm -hmm. So you you know, as an as an employer working, your if you have employees that get sick you there's nothing that you can do to cover yourself for the fact that they might get sick on the job you're going to just have to rely on the fact that you kept good protocols in place and if they come back and say you know i got sick working here you're mm -hmm. going to have to show that you have good protocols in place to cover the fact that your employees got sick working for you do you um do you foresee insurance companies moving rapidly to come up with that have you heard anything or it sounds like maybe not no, they won't. I doubt that anyone will. No, no, it's way too much of a high risk. Yeah, and okay. that's why it's all sort of being, I think it will end up being people, you know, employers showing if, if some employee wants to sue them or say, yeah, I got sick while I was working for you and you didn't provide masks, for example. You know, I, I think the employer, employee could sue you and say, you didn't, you had me go and do these right. six jobs and you didn't give me any masks or any, the right PPE and I got sick and you know, they've got a really good claim, unless you're an employer that can say, I tried, they were unavailable, I provided face shields, and I provided them training to show them how to clean those face shields, for example. And if you didn't okay. use the face shield, that then it's your fault. Um, so I won't uh, name who this is or anything, but uh, currently we are recommending customers wear masks during audits, but we haven't gone so far as to require them. So I, this is an auditing company um, who's talking about their customers in the home. Um, yeah. and, and some staff are nervous about customers not agreeing to wear a mask. What risk level do you see with this if our staff are wearing masks? So if the customer doesn't want to wear a mask, then I would say you have a couple of options. My, the options I would recommend would be that they agree to sit in one room with the door closed as a sort of a you know, isolated, or mm -hmm. you just defer that until a later date and just decide not to go and do that, whatever that job is. I mean, I think it's also the way, that's why we have that communication module. It's the way that you approach it with them. And if you like have masks that you can bring and you could say, you know, this is for your safety as much as anyone else's. And, you know, if you wear it or, or however you want to, to word it, I think, and then if they absolutely adamantly refuse, I think you'd be, you know, if they refuse to sit in a room, I don't know whether I'd even want to go necessarily work at that house or do that work because you are then putting people at risk. I mean, it would be up to, I guess, the individual company. A lot of lead projects as well. Um, yeah. And, you know, one of the one of the credits you can pick up is for uh, what we call a pre-occupancy flush. Obviously makes a lot of sense on an existing or a new build, maybe not so much an existing home. But the idea is that you're you're flushing out all the toxins that are left over from the construction process right before the occupants move yeah. in. So you're flushing it mm -hmm. out using, you know, you're running all the HVAC, you're opening all the windows. So what kind of conversations are there about maybe using that same strategy when you go to, you know, do work on someone's house or, you know, in order to also, you know, flush out any potential viral in the air? So if there's people living in the house, I don't think, I mean, even if you were to run a blower door for a whole bunch of time, I was on a call with um, Paul Francisco oh. and Rick Cog, and you guys might yeah. know them yep. from all the ASHRAE. Um, and they were both saying you can have dead parts of dead air parts of the house where you can run a blower door and you still aren't moving air. So relying on that type of thing to flush out the house, for example, before you go there is not going to be as um, effective as just wearing good PPE. I mean, there are doctors working in coronavirus, COVID-19 wards 
day in day out who still aren't test testing positive because they've they're wearing the correct PPE and I think that if you go into a house that's your best strategy not trying to flush things out um, you know you, you just don't know and you might as well be protected yourself and go in there and use good protocols you know, wash your hands as you leave the house use you know some kind of sanitizer on your hands be careful when you get into the, your truck if you've got the co-worker in your truck how are you going to separate yourself from them on the drive or you're going to have the windows down I mean those are the types of things that I think are more important to think about than flushing out a house um you mentioned you know doctors but don't typical locations like that have really high filtration and ventilation rates yeah they do but there's still people around your people that are around heavy loads of virus mm -hmm. so if you're around the heaviest loads of virus and you can be you're using PPE. I mean, you're, le you're leaning over people and putting tubes in them and that type of thing. So there's there's uh, PPE is like your first. If it, 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 it's it's not your first method of staying safe. Your first method of staying safe would be not even to go in in the first place. Right, right, but, right. I mean, I think it's it's more effective than worrying about you know have you flushed all that of the house out correctly because that's you're going to be able to get a lot maybe a lot out with a blower door test or with good ventilation but ultimately it's you know not exposing yourself it's it's going to get in because you've touched your face or you've inhaled it so those are the two things you have to be constantly aware of yeah yeah and and to be sure um was certainly not uh was certainly not saying that in lieu of um uh, you know, PPE, right? Um, so I, I just want to make sure I wasn't yeah. stating that in yeah. lieu of, I was saying in, 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 in along with, uh, I, I guess. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and like you were saying with the lead protocol, I mean, if no one's in, if, if people, if you've had workers in that and then people are going to be occupying it, you know, if, if nobody occupied it for two or three days, the virus can't just live on surfaces indefinitely. And I think, you know, I know hotels around here are doing a three-day on three-day protocol where once someone's checked out, they leave the room empty for three days before it can be occupied again. So if it's an empty building, it's way more straightforward than if it's a building where there's if it's a home with someone in there. Sure, got it. Um, and uh, just trying to um, bring back your slide up here so everyone can see it. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and let's yeah. see, now that I can see the questions and I am back in, let's see what other questions we've got here other than, hey, I can't hear you. <laughs> we've got a lot of those. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for that. Um, anyway, uh, let's see this other one. Okay, so somebody here is just kind of making a comment that, uh, well, I guess that's a, it's a great, it's a great question, you know, to what extent um, should somebody who doesn't feel safe going into a house because picking up back where we left off, someone wasn't wearing a mask, you know, terminate the visit, say, I'm not coming in, but then risk, you know, potentially risk their job, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I would, I, in that situation, before you even go into the house, I'd try and have your employer have a clear guidance for what to do and what, what situation. And you could even express your discomfort going into a house and say, if there's going to be a house where someone's not going to be wearing a mask, or, you know, am mm. I, can I go in? Can I leave mm. if they, you know, it, it's sort of like going into a house where someone's got a barking dog, you know, trying to jump on you. Mm -hmm. If you're not safe in that situation, your employer should have your back. Or maybe you need, that's the conversation you need to have with your employer before you go there so that you know where you are. And, and you know, like I, I have, people that I know work um, with us and they, you know, like there's one person who's fairly immunocompromised and that person would definitely not, you know, would want to be having a work from home sort of scenario. And other people may feel a lot more comfortable or a lot more confident going in. And you know, I think it, if you're a, a reasonable employer, you need to take people's concerns <laughs> into account. You can't just say, well, this mm -hmm. is my policy and you're going in regardless. I, I almost think you could, you know, mm -hmm. you shouldn't work for them if they had that kind of an attitude. 
<laughs> I wanted to, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'll go, you know, there's plenty, plenty of people hiring right now. Right. We'll, we'll go yeah, work somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah. so back to what we were saying before I saw somebody made a great comment and I wish I had seen it, um, before I started talking, but it's just, it's more of a comment. Um, you know, and so I wanted to share it out here. So, so those who can't see it, um, they've said, I set up my work site to include zip wall containment systems air scrubber with pre-filter charcoal filter and hepa filter and a portable uv generator while performing our services so um would love to hear back on on that one in the future yeah. to see you know obviously if, if nobody who's been working in those sites uh would would be exposed i mean i guess you leave home you leave the site and then you know all you know all all uh, <laughs> game back on i guess so yeah yeah, and that's those are great protocols, and that's also something you could do in an office. You could put like in between office desks, you could put up a, you know, a zip wall. You could have a HEPA filtration, you know, system in each little cubicle that you make. But then you wouldn't move that one from one cubicle to another cubicle because then you could cross contaminate. You know, so all those types of things are great. Those those containment strategies are excellent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I um, yeah, and and I, I didn't want to say that in a way that uh, many was about. I think it's uh, definitely good to think through these things. And quite frankly, when you're working on a project, um, you know, let's set aside COVID-19. There's all sorts of exposure to all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. VOCs, TVOCs, influenza, which is getting worse to my knowledge from what we can tell um yeah. and and i you know and if you if you look at some of the studies carbon dioxide as that builds up it actually um can make it harder for us to do our jobs or learn right if we're all mm -hmm. breathing in a space so mm -hmm. all these different yeah. strategies keep all those things away too which were there before now we've got it's just kind of a win-win-win yeah. from what i can tell so yeah and anyone who's been doing like lead safe work rp stuff or asbestos and you know can you know it's really the same kinds of protocols that you're taking yeah um well uh amanda uh we had a couple bumpy rides here but i think this was a really good conversation um i think it was long overdue for us to have this conversation and i think people are going to continue to have this um and we hope to maybe come back and you know see what else we can do to get the word out as things change but um, before we wrap up, where can go people go to learn more information? I heard you might have some kind of special deal for folks who want to take the course. Um, and anything for those in the weatherization industry, are there any extra resources yeah. for them too? Yeah. So if you are currently working with the Weatherization Assistance Program, this course is free because the Department of Energy is offering it for WAP people. Right mm -hmm. now, uh, if you're in WAP, you can email me and uh, I can add you in through our learning management system. In another week or so, NREL, National Renewable Energy Labs, are going to be hosting it on their system, their learning management system for weatherization personnel. If you're not working, and then it, it's free. If you're working in weatherization, if you're not working in weatherization, it is as a special deal, and I think I mentioned it earlier, for people watching this webinar, it's $50. It's usually $75. So if you email me, and my email is there, you can email me and say, hey, I'd like to take the course. All I need is your name and email. And we would either do a credit card or we can take a, uh, I just send a quick contract and we invoice against the contract. Um, and we usually can get you into the class within, uh, you know, four or five hours. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. We've had, I think so far we're up to maybe 1,200 people have taken it. Mm, great. Around the country. Yeah. Great, great. Well, Amanda, I... Thank you so much for your time. Thanks to Energy Smart Academy. It looks like there's some other great content over at Energy Smart Academy outside of just this. So um, yeah. I encourage you all <laughs> to go check it out over there at Energy Academy, energysmartacademy.com. And thank you again. Have a great rest of your week, everyone. And you know, follow the protocols. Stay in when you don't have to go out. Stay safe. Um, let's beat Watch this thing. Hands. Let's see, let's see you all in real life. You know soon um and maybe we'll all be done with webinars eventually <laughs> we'll be burned out so thank you so much take care man bye bye <laughs>